Hello, everyone, and welcome to Screenwalks. This is the first Screenwalk of 2023. Very excited. I am Marco De Mutis, digital curator at Photo Museum Winter Tour in Switzerland. And together with John Uriarte, the Photographer's Gallery in London, we have created this collaborative program of fortnightly live streamed events. So through Screenwalks, we are interested in investigating the changing role of the photographic image in its networked and digital forms. Each event is led by an artist, a researcher, or a curator who takes the audience to the spaces where their core practices take place. Screenwalks can be a live performance, a peek behind the scenes of an art talk, or a guided online tour, among other possible formats. We have hosted more than 50 Screenwalk events so far. This is actually the 55th. And you can find video recordings of each one of them on our website and YouTube channel. We have featured international artists such as Penelope Umbrico, Joanna Moll, Constant Dollard, Moreshin Alayari, Jenny Odell, many others. Um, so please check out the Screenworks archive for more. Um, finally, if you have found Screenworks useful for your professional or personal interests, do consider subscribing to Folders. Folders is our subscription model, and for seven euros, you support the program and its artists, and also get your personalized folder on folders.screenworks.com. There, you'll receive files and extra content from the artists and researchers of Screenwalks. Our program remains open, accessible, and free to everyone. But if you have the possibility to support us with a monthly donation, please do subscribe to Folders. <clears throat> and now, some housekeeping information. Your microphone should be muted to avoid noise disturbances. If it's still on, please mute it now. We are recording this event, and we will be archiving it. So please use the public chat um, to interact with each other and ask questions and comments, or feel free to send private messages to John or to me. Hello from my side too. I'm John Uriarte, curator of the digital program at the Photographer's Gallery uh, in London. Today, we will be jumping across the internet uh, using two of its most significant features the hyperlink and the Wikipedia. Uh, game developer, writer, and artist Everest Pipkin will take us on a journey through various Wikipedia articles using network images as nodes of connection between ideas related to memory, collectivity, and remembrance. For those of you who experienced the early days of the internet, uh, when clicking was a much more frequent interaction than scrolling, the screen walk today might take you back in time. Uh, drift linking through photographs hosted on Wikipedia Commons, uh, we will be led into a learning pathway while navigating from topic to topic. Inspired by the Wikipedia races, in which uh, several people compete to go from one Wikipedia article to another using the fewest links possible, the event today will reflect on collective and network web pages and visual media. Everest Pipkin is a game developer, a writer, and an artist from Central Texas who lives and works on a sheep farm in southern New Mexico. Their work, both in the studio and in the garden, follows themes of ecology, tool making, and collective care during collapse. They hold a BFA from the University of Texas at Austin and an MFA from Carnegie Mellon University and have shown and spoken at the Design Museum of London, the Texas Biennale, the 21 train Tiennale of Milan, the Photographers Gallery in London, uh, the Center uh, for Land uh, Use Interpretation, and many other uh, spaces. Uh, when not at the computer in the heat of the day, uh, as today, you can find them in the hills, spending time with uh, their neighbors, both human and non-human. Um, Everest. We are very happy to have you uh, with us today. The screen is yours. Hello. Um, thank you so much for joining me here. Give me just one moment. I'll get this set up. OK. So um, 
I grew up in that brief happy window between school computer labs and school firewalls. Um, my elementary school had 16 computers, uh, Blueberry IMAX, which were donated from Apple during one of their giveaway PR drives that sort of distributed computers to elementary schools across the United States. Um, the librarian was so proud of them. I'd, uh, I'd take lunches in there and browse uh, over the lunch bell, um, reading facts and early blogs sort of linked from um, cool side of the day indexes. It uh, Later on, I'd play flash games and I'd role play on forums and I'd adopt ePets and I'd make websites. Um, all of the trappings of a child who was let loose on a world still building, a world in which a child could actually still have a hand in building. Of course, <laughs> this didn't last. Um, by the time I was in the eighth grade, school administrators had installed a firewall on the school's computer network, and this was for our safety, of course. Um, and, you know, there were ways, ways around this, uh, proxy servers, leader X, uh, VPNs, admin logins, swipes from teacher's desks, that sort of thing. Um, but there weren't ways around a teacher coming up behind you to catch you playing flash games on school time. We diversified, we grew clever. Um, like every technology oriented hobbyist before us, uh, we found out that the computer itself was a kind of toy. Um, or at least could be used to make toys. Uh, surveilled by the, the typing instructor in the 10 minutes before class let out, we played the kinds of games that weren't games by the looking, animating stick figures and PowerPoint, playing Battleship and Excel, changing all the UI sounds on Windows and me to play a prank on the next person who sit, sat down. And then of course, wiki racing. Wiki races are a simple concept. Players must navigate from one article to another, um, using only lateral links to do so. You click from idea to idea, concept to concept, attempting to piece a path through the connective tissue, uh, winnowing towards your destination article by finding sort of ever more related concepts. It's a game of dead ends and surprising turns and as a child, um, plenty of guesses in the dark about what a particular word might mean or where a place actually is in this world. Like any game played on schoolyards, there are an infinity of variations to the wiki race. The back button is banned, no sidebars. We start in the same place. We start somewhere different, no going through UK, no going through United States. Winner is the fastest. Winner is uh, the least number of clicks, no keyboard, no control F, two players, 10 players. The destination is decided each time. The destination is the other player's random article. The destination is selected from the following list. Uh, the destination is, and for us, it always was the article on philosophy. Um, we played like this, two players, an audience to ensure honesty, a countdown, a click on random article in the sidebar. And here's where fairness broke down, of course. One might have a direct link to philosophy from the random article, um, while another might be one line of text about a bird species in the Arctic. But that was the exciting part, the, the not knowing where you'd begin. You could click on any blue link in the article itself. Uh, no back button, no search, no new random article. The clock is ticking. Where have you gotten yourself to? Your friend is trying to hurt, help. Oh, look, look, they're saying, look, that links to church. Someone else is screaming, no cheating. A piece of food is thrown or a pencil case. The typing instructor is raising an eyebrow. The class bell is about to ring. The bags are being gathered. Chairs are starting to push back.
you're sweating a little. It feels like maybe you've actually gone the wrong direction at some point. Like you could have found the path just a little bit back. And finally, you arrive at philosophy. The mega concept, those reliably linked out to everything eventually, especially the more abstract things get. Um, most things have some philosophical element once they get big or heady enough. And at least if not that, they might've been named after someone who once invented a theory. These are sweet memories in their way. Um, they are, you know, children skipping through sort of the mass of human history and turning it into a game of structure um, and movement, not one of, of reading or of depth. Connectivity over content. A learning of the shape of the thing. That's hyperlinks for you. Tim Berners-Lee, eat your heart out. In recent years, I found I wanted to use the wiki racing format for something else again. Um, I envisioned this lecture of sort of interrelated thoughts uh, where the source material was on screen even as I talked over it. The structure apparent, citations sought, shot through implicitly, the web of references spiraling out even as I pick a path between them. Tracing my own walk slower now, now that I'm not a child and don't run like I once did. in front of an audience, of course, who can verify that I'm not cheating. The appeal for me here is the externalized memory system, the collective one, the one that lets me apply my structural knowledge to other people's specific depths. This is reflected in the way that I've memorized a dozen surefire paths to philosophy once you get past a certain point. Although my own undergraduate studies in the subject, of course, constrain all of my year's worth of knowledge to a philosophy to one paragraph of the, of the philosophy article, contents 3.1 on aesthetics, um, which I could read in a few bare sentences. Uh, this Collective memory system, of course, is the, the great promise of Wikipedia after all, the free encyclopedia that anyone can edit. Wikipedia owes a lot of its philosophical origins to GNU, the general public license, um, first written in 1989 and one of the cornerstones of the free software movement. This ideological origin of Wikipedia has perhaps gotten a bit lost in the history of these interceding years, but Wikipedia is the free encyclopedia to borrow from GNU in liberty, not in price. The four freedoms of the GPL are this, freedom zero, the freedom to use the program for any purpose, freedom one, the freedom to study how the program works and change it, freedom two, the freedom to redistribute and make copies, and freedom three, the freedom to improve the program and release your own improvements. Although this is a laudable set of goals on paper, uh, these freedoms are not without their critics. And that although I have used free software licenses for specific projects and probably will again, I would count myself among them. Um, free software comes from a libertarian worldview. Fundamentally, I do not want my work used for any purpose. I have an agenda for the world I want built and I seek to plant the seeds of that world in my work by any means available. If the tools I make could be turned across purpose, I'm not above restricting their usage with licensing. This is anathema to free software, of course, and I can't help but wonder if I spent my days writing articles instead of code bases, if I would eventually come to a similar place. I'm not sure. They're different types of tools, but anyone who's familiar with the free and open source software community would recognize a brand of the internal politicking of Wikipedia within it. 
flame and edit wars, vandalism, malicious revision, self-aggrandizement, every Wikipedia talk page is a uh, listserv in miniature. And of course, a particular type of volunteer, the list well-known, um, generally white, generally English speaking, but more than anything else, with enough free time to take weekends to contribute labor to unpaid projects. These with every accordant ballot bias bundled in, even as work is done at an editorial level towards balance. There's also a, to be sure, deeply necessary for projects like Wikipedia, um, orientation towards truth here, but always a truth that um, can be held up by per a personal citations, white papers, references. In my own life, I find this kind of truth a little bit distasteful, which is to say, it casts untruth on all that cannot be that cannot meet its standards, untruth on that which is not citable. This puts the onus of proof on those who have not had their experiences verified by power. Given all this, it is perhaps a little bit funny that I should love Wikipedia as much as I do, but I do love Wikipedia uh, in a way that is not purely beholden to the information held within it. I don't visit Wikipedia like I read a book. It is for browsing, for picking the sweet berries off of and eating them fresh, still warm from the sun. I wake up after night spent diving from article to article to find 45 tabs open in my browser and a folder full of screenshots and a fuzzy sort of um, empty kind of feeling like I was chasing something just ahead of me always out of reach, always just in the next article. And now in the morning, all I have left is the shape of it. And uh, no, even that's gone. I think it's the, the passion of the place that gets me. Even sublimated through revisions and editing processes, even with fact checking and the established Wikipedia and writing voice and the disclaimers that this section needs verified sources, the care comes through. Somebody loves that seabird. Somebody loves this opera cycle, this particular tomb and all of its attendant atrocities. Someone drives the state route every single day that goes through the mountains and is going to write about the view. It's the excitement that catches me, the way that leaks into the barest sentences the way they demand their own remembering. And the way it catches in the links, how every single piece of blue text is an invitation, a beckoning. It says, oh, you're interested in the memex, that 1944 hallucination of a computational internet that preceded and influenced so much of the internet we have now, albeit one designed on microfiche. Well, maybe then you'd be interested in the mundanium. 20th century data collection attempt to classify the world. Yes, it was called the World Palace. It was to sit inside of, as it was designed, a world city. The collection once had 12 million index cards. This was a peace project, the kind of European 20th century peace project that believes indexing the world will lead to an ultimate understanding of it, and that an understanding of the world might lead to somehow unity among men as if understanding would follow like a dog at heel, the capacity to remember. Always in these total collection efforts, it's what's excluded from the archive that tells the broader story. Even in this era of data gathering and surveillance, it is specific motions that are collected. My browsing, my watching, the things I buy, the messages I leave for others in public, but not, of course, the eggs I trade to a neighbor the things I say to a dog, my dogs, the little curving catch in my chest when I click through to a notification I've been waiting to receive. It's the great dream of utopian total recollection archive projects and advertisers both to dully record all this too, of course. And Lord knows they're trying. 
Every smart home device and wearable comes ready to tell on a blush and to repeat the secrets I say to my oatmeal. But aggregate data is not an archive in the same way a library is an archive. A data set reduces to patterns and forgets or privatizes the rest, often throwing away the human inside of it. A card catalog attempts to point to specifics by which you might imagine the whole, often by throwing away that which does not fit into the current narrative favored by power or dominant culture. They both attempt to extend memory, but in doing so, compress it. A reduction from the dense, infinitely detailed moment to moment into. For instance, here is what is said. Here is how it looked. Here is who is here. Here is the date and the time. Even when or if it all catches my pulse, my blink, my blush, there will be more left written recorded. The only storage medium big enough to hold the world is the world. That blink existed even if it was impressed on history, even as it is forgotten, even as it erodes away in the slow action of the turning of time. that the list of films about memory should be so short and the list of films about amnesia should be so long is a joke of specificity. This is exactly what happens when a subject too broad loses focus in the list. This is because, of course, every film is a film about memory. Every film is a display of dead moments, arranged, memorial, cataloged. I recently watched, re-watched Chris Marker's Sunless. In it, he describes a film he'd like to make. It's also named Sans Soleil. It's also a science fiction movie posing as a documentary about a time traveler. He says, I imagine him moving slowly, heavily about the volcanic soil that sticks to the souls. All of a sudden he stumbles. And the next step, it's a year later. He's walking on a small path near the Dutch border along a seabird sanctuary. That's it for the start. Now, why this cut in time, uh, this connection of memories, that's just it. He can't understand. He hasn't come from another planet. He comes from our future, 4001, the time when the human brain has reached the era of full employment. Everything works to perfection. All that we allow to slumber, including memory, logical consequence, total recall is memory anesthetized. After so many stories of men who lost their memory, there is a, here is a story of one who's lost forgetting and who, through some peculiarity of his nature, instead of drawing pride from the fact and scorning mankind of the past and its shadows, turns to it first with curiosity and then with compassion. In the world he comes from, to call forth a vision, to be moved by a portrait, to tremble at the sound of music, can only be signs of a long and painful prehistory. He wants to understand. I once watched a campus building get torn down over the course of several weeks. I was working at a warehouse near the university. I would take my lunch break sandwiches and sit across the street to watch the cranes. For some reason, rather than take the building down all at once, maybe safety, all those students, they were demolishing it front to back in layers. It was a four or five story building and Warren like having served mostly as professorial offices. Every day by lunchtime, a new tableau had been sheared off, a new network of rooms and hallways visible from the air. Much of the furniture was still in place. I assume anything wanted had been removed and it was cheaper or more labor effective to simply sort through the rubble for the rest. Um, once I saw the huge scoop of an excavator come straight down onto a desk, which tumbled to the earth with the floor that had been beneath it. And as it fell, the drawers opened and thousands of papers flew into the sky, swirling like birds before they drifted down to cover the entire build site. Nobody picked them up, and within a half hour, another slice of building came down, burying the paper and concrete and rebar. I later found out that it was the old philosophy department. I'm writing this paragraph a few days before I'm scheduled to give this lecture. It's two in the morning. 
<laughs> I've just come back inside from the animals. I went out to feed everybody something little just because I knew I wouldn't be up very early. The moon was just down and in the pasture in the dark, I turned off my flashlight and I stood there for a moment in the cold, my breath billowing out around me under the crawling winter stars. And it was then that I remembered about the comet. The green comet of now, late winter 2023, brightest tonight, was last year 50,000 years ago. It appeared in the sky above a prehistory where human beings still lived next to our sibling species, Neanderthals and Denisova people. In the sky here, it's still, it's stuck between Ursa Major and Minor, which means that it hardly moves over the course of the night. Close to Polaris, the stars appear to rotate around it. This was the first time I'd seen it, fuzzy, faint, but unequivocally there unmistakable from anything else. A cottony little smudge of a thing. It looks more like a pantry moth cocoons. I've been cleaning out of the dry goods all month than some fiery sword. Still though, <laughs> an orbit of 50,000 years. That's a hell of a thing. Welcome back, I said with such firm loudness that uh, as if I had to raise my voice a bit for the comet to hear. And the donkey started from his patient chewing behind me and went bouncing off into the dark. In summer of 2020, during the, the first summer of the pandemic, I became singularly obsessed with comet Neowise, or to be more accurate, one of the comets Neowise, as they're named for the telescope, not the individual body. I was living back in my hometown, and every night for two and a half weeks, I climbed the biggest hill around, which was above the new library that wasn't built when I was a kid, and sat watch with my binoculars. There was an older man always there with his telescope set up. He graciously trained it to the comet, wipe down the eyepiece with rubbing alcohol and retreat 15 feet back so I could take a look. We shout pleasantries at each other over the parking lot. He was the only friend I made that year and I didn't ever learn his name. My fondness for comets is partly their showy nature, partly a half-remembered childhood viewing of the last time Haley Bob came through in 1997, and a lot their implicit relationship with deep time, with periodic orbits so outside the scale of a human year or even a human life. There is a theory that it was comets that brought the early the ocean to an early earth, that it was a billion years of bombardment to the aggregated ice into ocean. Few to none of these would be the comets we're still grazed by. Subsumed by ice, those com comets became the terrestrial water. Comets that pass close to the sun are called sun grazers. Small sun, grazers, sun, small sun grazers vaporize at perihelion. Large ones may escape intact, but always the sum of itself lost in the brilliance. Like a favorite memory, access too often, replaced by the memory of visiting the memory. These are often the brightest comets, the so-called great comets. And if I had to name this hour of talking, it would be named this, sun grazer. Comets have gripped more than my attention in the fullness of time, and everything from famine to floods to births to plagues has been set up upon their appearances. They're even supposed to foretell a good wine year. Um, comet vintages denote a grape harvested under a great comet, and foretell, and although this is a distinctly unsightable truth, they do call a little extra attention or price. Um, when I first sat down to write this talk uh, a good month ago now, I thought I'd better read up a little on the subjects I thought I'd touch. Memory, monuments, deep time. I'd never seen Cave of Forgotten Dreams, Herzog's 2011 documentary about the cave paintings at Chavot, despite it being his most popular film. It opens the very first shot on a vineyard planted just outside the cliffs that house the caves of paintings. But the paintings are pre-wine, the pre-fermentation. They're also pre-grapes, at least as we know them. Before domestication, they were a much smaller, more tannic berry. If the people who plant painted the bears and the horses at the caves ate grapes, it would have been these wild fruits, acrid and seedy, barely recognizable as the same fruit to a modern palate. I didn't love the movie. It was fine, beautiful even, but affected a flattening of subject. Perhaps I should have tried to see it in 3D as it was shot. Perhaps I would have been happier just reading the Wikipedia article on it. But I loved the opening on grapes. In this way, the people who painted the pictures feel even more recognizable as us.
how art making has changed so little and all the time it took to produce the cultivation of grapes. At Chavot, the dating of the cave paintings is done both by radiocarbon and by observation. Both point to two periods of human habitation, some 60,000 years apart, which is incidentally about as far from now as the first large scale production of wine circa 4000 BCE. Before, between, and after the periods of human painting, the cave was home to a now extinct species of cave bear. Their scratches also mark the walls and are incorporated into the work in places, interspecies collaboration over thousands of years. And over it all grows a fine calcite crystal. It is also used to date the markings. Stone in particular environments forms at a specific rate over millennia. Chavot has been closed to the public since it was found. A lesson learned on Lascaux and other famous caves. Show caves are all but destroyed by visitation. The microbes that hike in on bodies and are that exhaled from breath make new lives in caverns, colonizing with mold and fungus and even simple carbon dioxide. There's no walking anywhere without altering. So instead, visitors go to replica caves built above ground in fastidious facsimile of the original with sound, humidity, and temperature all but controlled to emulate the cave directly beneath it. Lascaux has three of these replicas with varying degrees of faithfulness to their source material. You can visit all three in one day and make a date of it. A facsimile is a kind of monument, a memorial to a thing which, even if it's still extant, cannot be viewed. They are for the looking without violence, or rather for looking with an approved kind of violence with the knowledge that a facsimile can always be remade and lose nothing. It's hard, to be, it's hard to predict what will be wanted in the future, which doesn't stop people from trying. The last century has seen the rise of the time capsule, a, a cultural invention that despite all appearances is for the now, not the later. A time capsule is made so you may believe some part of you will last, will be remembered, no matter how, you, uh, no matter that they are inevitably fairly uninteresting upon their opening full of, to quote, useless junk, albeit pristine and new use, useless junk. There are even time capsules buried in space. The type pioneer plaques and the Voyager probes and someday possibly KEO, a proposed artificial comet that has been set back some 20 years uh, with a timeline that is more launch delays than updates. KEO is made to carry DVDs as well as some terrestrial samples. We'll have a 50,000 year periodic orbit and upon the entry its thermal air is designed to burn off to create an artificial aurora. Time capsules are fine examples of speculation. They are stories about what humanity is with every rough edge smoothed over for the sake of looking good for the future. Speaking of narratives, did you know that the Library of Alexandria didn't burn? There was possibly a warehouse fire at some point which took some scrolls set by Julius Caesar and his own ships, but all evidence points to a library that simply experienced a slow decline in prestige and cultural importance over a period of centuries until its collection was divvied out slowly to other institutions and finally lost. Chris Marker wrote about a time traveler who conquered time. He remembers with perfect recall every detail of his life. He wishes to cry unbidden at music, feel his heart quicken and not know the cause. This is why he returns to our time to witness the love of people who love without understanding why. But my time traveler comes from farther. He recalls not every detail of his life, but of all time. Um, he extrapolates what will come from the perfect detail of the present. And by studying the present, he knows also the past. Like the scientists who trace in the air, unable to paint, touch the painted wall, their own touch, a corruption, the movement of the cave bear marks, painter, then bear, then painter, then bear again. He can excavate from the present moment, scything both directions and time until it is all one flat panel of inevitability. For my time traveler, there is no need for museums. Every object is an equal archive. Everything present has achieved total density. He walks the earth completely untethered, transparent, time melts away from him. He's not come to now from the future. He simply sees it all unraveling. He lives as much as anyone like him can be said to 
be to, can be said to live floating. This brings another meaning to the phrase until the end of time. It is monuments that most desire eternity. They operate on a different time scale than us. Furious focused memories carved from materials that resist change. But even monuments lived in public. You can see evidence of the visitors to the Grey Fires Bobby Fountain and the shine of his nose, which is rubbed for good luck. The tarnish comes up and some of the bronze with it, enough so that officials have attempted to curb the practice for fear of degradation. A rounding made by many hands. And many hands over a relatively short period of time. This photo of the fountain circa 2003 from the last 2017 shows a node still patinaed. Even images in the Wikimedia Commons catch the motions. Greyfriars Bobby was a terrier who lived for two years with a, breathing, with a breathing man. He then lived for 14 years above a dead one. What love must have existed in those two years to ask for 14 following of devotion? Or from another angle, what cruelty must exist in this world to resign a dog to sleep on the grave of a dead man for 1,500 consecutive nights? Greyfriars Bobby is not the only dog to be memorialized in this way. Stories of loyal animals are popular fodder. They become monument when they are gone. The best of us, they are brave, loyal, smart, went into the unknown, saved a life. When they were violent, it wasn't their fault. They were simply doing what they were asked to do. Plus, well, everyone loves a statue of a dog. They're the kind of statues that invite you to rub their noses in passing. Dogs, Canis familiaris, Canis of, canine of the household, Dogs were domesticated some 15,000 years ago, before grapes, but after painting, probably. The line between wolf and dog is a fuzzy one, and some anthropologists claim a species friendship that goes far, far longer. Regardless, they were the first domesticated species, and this can be seen on a genetic level, with a set of gene-based cognitive changes directly oriented at understanding and communicating with humans. There are a lot of famous dogs, but few with stories like Laika. A stray pulled off the street a week before the launch of Sputnik 2. Laika was the first living creature in orbit. Although other sparse-faring dogs returned to Earth and resumed normal lives, even giving birth to puppies, one of which was sent to John F. Kennedy, Laika was never intended to return. Before the launch, she was taken home by a mission scientist to play with his children. He wrote later, Laika was so quiet and charming. I wanted to do something nice for her. She had so little time left to live. Official documents from the launch call her from a variety of names, including Little Bug, Little Lemon, and Curly. It wasn't after until it wasn't until after that Laika Barker was settled on. She has several statues and a plaque, as well as a postage stamp and a brand of cigarettes, and of course, an entire Wikipedia article under her name. Is this propaganda or a memorial? It's both, of course. Most things are. I started this year with an expectation of animal, of lambs. My sheep are a hardy breed, uh, well adapted to the desert and generally needing little help with anything other than the reliable arrival of hay in their pasture. So I was surprised to find one of the ewes in a hard and early labor in the first week of January. Sheep are born feet first, followed by the head, then the shoulders. The lambs orient themselves in the womb, diving into life like dolphins. I knew something was wrong right away, of course, but I didn't really grasp the severity of it until I saw the limp little head dangling from the body like an apple. I intervened, delivered a dead lamb, and buried it in a deep but tiny grave on top of the hill in the pet cemetery that I inherited with my house. I never met the animals that are buried in the pet cemetery, but I've been going up to pay my respects to Chucho, Red, Angel, and the four other marked but unnamed graves for years. I think of all the pets I've had to leave buried behind houses I once lived in, a renter who could not take my beloved bones with me, and I hope that someone else does the same. The lamb joins them. All life makes cemeteries. The headstones are their own kind of monuments, even if the pet graves are made of rough carved wood, already bleaching to brittleness in the sun, sticking up from the hilltop. They're like a pincushion, each pinning now to the present. They say, I lived, I ran, I barked. I wonder sometimes if it's the tragedy itself that cuts the gap through time. 
severs the threads of history and stitches the event to the now, present here today preserved by the jagged edges of its own violence, or if it's instead the marker, which is in its solidness attempting to interrupt the flow of time and halt its soothing work, like a deep pit in a river. Only last week, I found a pair of the Unmet Chucho's dog tags, which were unearthed in the sheep pen by the turning of hooves. They're shaped like little bones. They're still in my jacket pocket. I worry them when I'm out in public. They replaced a small agate pebble that I carried for many years, my fingers turning it into a teardrop shape. I lost it a few months ago, though I'm hoping it might be in some more esoteric pocket or fallen into the lining of my great coat. I used to lose it every spring, after all, when I put the coats away. Given how small the earth is and how many people have walked on it and the way that landscape sort of fits itself to human life, it's hard to imagine that there's any sites where a memorial could not be placed, where, where tragedy has not struck in large or in small. Heather grows pink, but it can occasionally bloom white. There's a wild mutation. It rises unbidden out of a normal population, but it's said that it will only bloom white where no blood has ever been spilled. Heather is specific, growing in a particular region. Yarrow is almost universal. A friendly plant, yarrow precedes people. No matter where you walk, it often isn't far. White petals, feathery leaves, it has a hundred names and a hundred uses. Stomach upset, toothache, astringent, but its main use was to staunch wounds. For this, it has been named bloodwort, night smell foil, staunch weed, and woundwort. It's said that the center Chiron taught Achilles to use Yarrow in the battlegrounds of Troy. From this, it took its Latin name, Achillea millifolium, Achilles thousand leaf. The first time I ever saw a pink Yarrow was on the island of Suomen Lina off the coast of Helsinki. Suomen Linea was a siege fortress built as a star fort in the 18th century. It saw a dozen wars, then a prison. There's still a penal labor camp on the island among the full few time residents and the picnicking tourists. I was there at midsummer. Longest day, there was no sunset. There was sunset, but no night. I swam in the ocean at two in the morning and I could still not see the stars for the glow at the horizon. By sunrise, I was dry and walking along the enforced battlements looking out to sea. In the cracks of the stone walls grew flowers, and although I didn't know most of them, there was yarrow, of course, but it was blooming pink and purple, like the color wild heather. I picked a flower head, confused, and pressed it in my paper bag. I later learned that a primary mutagen for yarrow includes gunpowder. History is full of river stones, memories that have been turned in the water so many times that they've become rounded, become soft. The ground remembers the gunpowder, but many of the people are busy forgetting it or telling a story about the memory of gunpowder, about the smell of it, the taste, the danger, the role it played in the Great War, but never again the cutting acrid moment when it bloomed like a flower across the much younger battlements, no moss between the stones to propel a thing of danger into the night. The horror of that, the ragged violence. Look, I'm doing it now, I'm rounding a story. There is no explicability until after. As the job of the editor, maybe, and the impulse that turns the world into encyclopedia entries. I do understand this. It is so hard to catch the specificity of moments. Trying, I fall into unnecessary hyperbole. I know that I have this tendency, an overbearing that comes from wanting to make sure that I'm understood, that I catch it, that I really show you. Rereading the words, it's always too much, too eager. In editing, I find myself winnowing, rounding, until there's little of the original left. Despite my feelings about citational truth, I do much the same. I can't tell you that I felt this way, so instead I just tell you I was there. When I write letters, they say things like, there's a fire going in the wood stove. The clouds have settled in over the stars. I'm eating lemon cake. Of course, I'm saying these things with a desperate specificity as if, each, if, as if each does actually hold the entirety of that moment. Today, I ate a pear. 
I saw a rabbit. I swept the kitchen. I want you to understand that I grew that pear myself, that I watered the sapling I planted last year three times a week, all summer, that when it surprised me with a half dozen pink blush fruits in the fall, I had to look up how to properly harvest them because I'd never grown pears before. How I found that in the reading, that unlike many fruits, pears are not best right off the tree. Instead, they sweeten in the cold and the dark of a root cellar. The sugar is concentrating and permeating the flesh until it becomes softer, rounder. How I've left them in the back of my refrigerator since September. And when I finally cut one open today with my knife with a cherry wood handle, it was as if a whole season of sunlight spilled out onto my kitchen table. The rabbit, the broom, the lemon cake, the wood stove. I want you to understand that each of these moments succeeded in catching me, holding for a second, all of my attention, all of my devotion. Like the pear, each wrapped me up in the solidness of life, suspended me in it, even if just for a second. Still, it isn't enough. There's no words to record this. It is the job of the world and the world only to have that moment of time. The rest is facsimile, memorial, story, propaganda article. So I write instead, hoping you'll fill the gaps. I put a log on the fire. You can see the moon out of my window. I've just gone and I've shushed my dogs who are barking. Thank you so much, Everest. I think it's nice maybe to take a little bit of a moment of uh, silence after this performance. Yeah, thank you so much from, from my side too. Uh, I think it's been uh, an amazing uh, performance in which you have shared quite a lot of uh, experiences and also like, uh, of course, Wikipedia articles, a very uh, diverse range of, of Wikipedia articles quite a mesmerizing in um, the screen work the one today so yeah thank you also from uh, my side for taking us uh, through all of these different uh, familiar looking yet uh, incredibly different um, pockets of of knowledge um, I just want to thank also all the audience who came to Zoom and the audience in Twitch um, who followed the screen work. Um, there's not gonna be a Q&A session today. So we leave you with more time to digest uh, this wonderful performance and uh, maybe a chance for you guys to try out a wiki race on your own. And we'll be back in two weeks. Yeah. Uh, we'll be looking forward to welcome you in two weeks on the 15th of February with Rosalie Yu on the second of the screen works of the 2023 season.